in a few seconds, we're going to have Jan from uh, Pixel Federation. So right now we are connecting to him. Hi, Jan. How are you doing? Hi, Igor. Doing fine. How are you? Uh, also good. Very excited for your talk. First, uh, nice. first question. You're based in Slovakia, right? Right. We have so many news about uh, the game industry in Slovakia last week. Like um, every everyone is brawling. Like um, there there are some like M and A activity and studios are being bought and sold. So like, how do you feel uh, being in game industry in Slovakia? Well, right now it's a pretty exciting time actually, because yeah, well, Slovakia isn't the biggest of countries, so uh, of course also our game development wasn't like somewhere in the in the top of Europe and we didn't have a lot of a lot of like professional studios and stuff we also we were a lot of uh, there was a lot of of course like passionate designers and developers that were kind of just doing their own thing and right now it just starts to really really like uh, kind of get more way more exciting we have a lot of studios we have a couple of companies that like want to want to try opening a studio in Slovakia or maybe already have so it's it's quite quite actually a ride right now. That's great to know. Uh, I hope uh, we will like notice Slovakia as a big spot on game industry map of the world. Great. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you and me both. You and me both. Yeah. So um, I'm passing over to you, and good luck with your talk. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Well. Hello. 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 And welcome uh, in my talk, uh, Designing for Life Ops, with a subtitle of Designing for Your Future Self. What that means, we'll get to in a minute, but let's start off with introductions. Although right now I see, yeah, slide, is it working? Is it? Yeah, should be working now. Right. Okay. Sorry for the, sorry for the problems. All right. So who am I? I'm Jan. As you can see, and also the fellow on the, on the screen, uh, I'm a game designer. Been a game designer for actually most of my life. I've always found it very fascinating. I started out with pen and paper, with LARPing, done some city games, like very hands-on stuff. That was that was kind of my my main bread and butter with designing. But I switched to digital. It does pay a little better. If I say so myself, and yeah, I've been in digital for nine years, so I I've gathered some experience of kind of what works, what doesn't, and and stuff like that. Stuff I want to share with you today, guys. So, uh, wh where do I come from? I come from Pixel Federation. This is uh, this is a smallish company from Slovakia, and we're based in Bratislava, the capital. And uh, yeah, well. The, the most relevant info you can see on on the screen on the slide, and uh, but what uh, what the actual important thing is about Pixel Federation that since since the beginning since the dawn of dawn of Pixel, uh, we have always been doing games that we were actually aiming to be there for for life, like real life ops games that were meant to stay like forever, which they won't. But hey, that's how we like to think about it. But so even like even when uh, when the when the industry wasn't all crazy about it, when life ops wasn't such a buzzword, we were already like creating games that we really really thought could could stand the test of time. And of course, something something went good, something went something went wrong. But we kind of learned from that, and that's what I'm gonna gonna talk about today. Designing for your future self, what does that mean? Well, that means that you will want to go from that strapping young lad on the left to the most, almost as strapping older lad on the right. Because one thing that you need to keep in mind during, uh, during this presentation, that all these, these design principles that I'm gonna talk about are mostly there for your convenience, okay? This is something that will make your life as a game designer a little bit easier if you think about it, okay? It's not, uh, this is, I'm not gonna share like uh, the recipes uh, for uh, instant success. Um, I'm gonna focus on the design, design side on how to actually grasp 
uh, the design process if you're actually starting out a game you want there you want to be there forever pretty much and yeah that means you're going to be old and great but with a hint of a smile if you follow these procedures correctly okay why should you care of course yeah as i said life ops is right now a big buzzword but still nothing better than just showing you some hard ass numbers so this is this is our first big hit this is train station these are the revenue numbers from uh well numbers the revenue the revenue numbers let's call them right now didn't want to disclose the uh, the complete numbers but you can have a comparative look at how it goes it would it was launched in 2010 and you can see the first year well you almost cannot see the first year so and but you can see the curve that that it that it took it actually flourished into into beauty and then now right now it is in a slow and steady decline since it's not the freshest game in the mar on the market anymore but that is also the role of uh, life ops uh, we actually make this a slow and steady decline instead of a major high high power jump off from a from a skyscraper so we still do think that train station has a couple of years in it. next next one is seaport that is a relatively newer ip so that was launched in 2015 and as you can see the first year almost non-existent again the second year not the greatest and then it started uh, started to actually gain some traction gain some numbers and then it then it just blew up because that was as i said uh, a newer game where the, all the principles that I, I will be talking about were already kind of in place, or a, the majority of them, and that really allowed us to kind of ramp up uh, way faster, uh, every, you know, even though compared to other other titles that that we put out. Next one is Train Station Two. This is actually our newest one, and here you can see it very very clearly. Like the first two years, nothing pretty much virtually nothing okay we launched at the end of 2017 so 2017 isn't the fairest of numbers here but 2018 should have made some profits which it did not at all but 2019 is super healthy looking very very good we're actually right now it's uh, the second biggest game in our company as as of as of the day today so and that is what because it is the newest title and the ramp up, of course, with uh, live design, uh, with live ops titles is always a little bit slower, at least for us. But we tend to kind of, well, go for the long game, so to speak. And this this is a graph I really like because this is our most successful title. This is Diggy's Adventure. And Diggy's Adventure like shows this whole graph shows up the beauty of live ops. And I'm just very, very sad that since I always uh, wanted to include only numbers of the years that uh, are already finished, so we know exactly what went down. I couldn't show you the numbers for this year, 2020, but uh, let me uh, let me tell you that if we continue roughly, roughly, in uh, the direction that we're walking on right now, uh, the next column you would see here on this graph would actually be the highest one. So as you can see, 2012, the launch year, nothing much. 2013, nah, not good, doing very good. 2014, a little bit better, but still very, very rocky. And then it took off. And actually, as I said, thanks to all the know-how that we have now, well, actually we're 2020 might be the best year yet for, for this game. So life ops, you definitely should care. All right, so what are the principles of of uh, this but oh okay maybe first first things first uh, what i do uh, what i do understand in their life ops uh, is actually anything and everything that you do with your game after it has been released i know there's a couple of uh, very different um, different definitions for life ops which uh, what is what isn't life ops uh, we kind of don't do that. I, I think we that is academia mongering, and that we leave to academics. We developers really like to be more practical. So life ops is everything you do after the release. So, so yeah, just to get that out of the picture. So, and what are the principles? The first one is progress. Progress is 
of course, the most important principle that holds true for all your life ops uh, that you will ever, ever undertake. Unless you, uh, you have to plan a game that has steady, palpable, tangible progress for the player. The player always needs to feel that his next session is somewhere else as the next session. Of course, that is that is a little bit different philosophy from like uh, hyper casual stuff, stuff like that. And that's what you need to focus on because if you're if you're aiming for the long game, this is what what will be the most basic of measures. Without meaningful sense of progress, your game won't last at all, at all. What we do is actually project the progress we want to see in the game. Okay, we really think about what the what the stuff that you will do with the with the game, what the player will experience, where where he will go, what what his journey throughout the progress will be, how it will look like, and actually in quite quite some detail. You should aim for at least two years of projected content, as you can see on on the slide. What we do in Pixel Federation, we actually aim to for three to five years actually just uh, just to see just to get a better feel because the longer you have the uh, your progress planned out the better because the better for actually for starting out your game because then you won't have to roll back a lot of stuff or just find out that it kind of bit you into the uh, in your ankles some sometime over like the third or fourth year when you're running the game then you find out well we kind of messed up the, the beginning Plan ahead, plan for as long as you can, actually, so that you get a good grip on the economics, on the system design, on all that stuff that can really come back and bite you where you don't want it. And the best, uh, the best uh, solution for that, actually, is actually to think in small steps, like think in really, really small steps. You should start out with what does the player want to achieve in his, his, in his next session? What does he want to achieve the next day? What does he want to achieve the next week? What does he want to achieve the next month? And so on and so forth. And before you know it, even such a daunting task as aiming for three years of projected content will be very, very tangible, very palpable. You, you will grasp it. Your players will be also probably able to grasp it. And I got a very good example of uh, how we can, for instance, the the, all the progress that your players make, well, as I said, I've already uh, used those words a couple of times, we'll use them again, has to be very tangible. And one of the good examples that we have is uh, from Train Station 2, our, our newest, uh, newest successful game, where actually we kind of didn't take our own advice to heart from the beginning and had to roll back a little bit. And I'll, I'll show you. How you started out was like this. This was like the probably more or less the first screen uh, of your train station to experience. Very nice, very beautiful. All, all that stuff just kind of is there, ready for you to explore, to kind of play with, stuff like that. Good. That was good stuff. Everybody thought it looked great. It played, played quite fine. But the numbers were just weren't there, and the feel wasn't there. And when we took a critical look of what actually went wrong with this, also got a some nasty reviews so yeah and the bad thing is i think they were right uh so we took a hard long look at what we wanted to achieve with the game and if we if we succeeded and we did not because the main thing that was missing was actually the player pro feel of progress so what we did what and we went and actually did this <laughs> this is how you start absolutely better on all fronts because this is something that will show you a promise of progress, something that you can actually see how, how everything changes with you playing, you feel your impact, you, you feel that the game you left yesterday is something else than the game that you're playing today. And it is thanks to your, and your actions and your actions alone, all this, all this progression, it's in your hands, it's very tangible, fantastic, fantastic stuff. So actually, we took a jackhammer and just busted out the whole game just to get the progress right. As I said, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's that progress is ultimate and you need it in your life ops game. Uh, and these are the numbers. Focusing on this tangible progress, well, it actually 
increased our D1, D3, and D7 retention by 85%. And day one, it was actually 100. But yeah, I just wanted to have a nice realistic number here so that I don't seem like too much of a show, show off. So 85%, let that sink in. Those are crazy numbers that really, really brought, brought this home. And as something for the, for the more money-oriented people amongst you, uh, the day one uh, average revenue per paying user, well, average revenue per user uh, went up, went uh, doubled, which is not too shabby. So don't think about progress only in a, in a strictly retention-wise way. Also think about it as, a, as something that will engage the players enough to actually make some purchases. Why not? Okay, but there is of course one thing that you're probably asking. Okay, so all that progress, a lot, a lot of progress, 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 progress. I mean, it sounds like a communist manifesto almost. Uh, what do we do in, with inflation? Yeah, inflation is a problem because of course, you start out in level one, everything's fine, everything's not tasty. Soon before you know it, you're over 9,000 and the problem is there. Let's, Crazy numbers, crazy inflation, stuff like that. How do we balance that out? How do we how do we keep it from like stumbling all over itself? And the cheat codes, the IDDQD, that's why the Doom guy's there, that we use is actually this. If you can, plan your progress to be linear. That is something that I really, really, really cannot, cannot over, uh, overstate that this is something that is very important because yeah, sure, it won't be the most flashy thing in, in existence, but it will get the job done, okay? Because then even if it's 9,000, if you started out at one and it's 9,000, it's, it's 15 million, who cares? It's just a number. Then if it's linear, it's just a number. It will take a large boulder off of your shoulders if you, if you just kind of plan it out to be linear. If you don't want to do that, if you're certain you can you can pull off a non-linear non pro progress curve, anywhere go for it of course but this is a this is a cheat that you might want to use you might not you'll see all right next thing content content is king you've heard that phrase a million times before you'll hear it a million times more uh of course progress and content go hand in hand but of course one thing that i need to stress really really hard is your gameplay. Your gameplay is the hook. It is the target dummy. The something that lures your enemies or your players, as we might refer to them, uh, in. Okay, so no matter what a system designer will tell you, uh, how great their their content looks in their Excel sheet, how fantastically it's thought out, how much of it he can pop up in 15 seconds, it is nothing if your gameplay of course doesn't hold up to par you can have a great game with with tasty gameplay that you can then tailor content to later but never the other way around so keep that in mind but all right back to content what you will need to do with your content that you're creating is measure it during life ops you will want to measure almost everything that you do uh but uh with content, of course, that is that holds true as well. Measure what you can create. All right. Be careful to f because this is this is probably one one of the things where a lot of games that want to be live ops fail ultimately that they cannot produce enough content fast enough. Okay, and of course there is no shame in kind of figuring out a little bit too late. It happens to the best of us, but. You want to figure that out as soon as you can. So start creating, launch a game, and really keep keep the tabs on how much content can you create. If you're if you can keep up with the flow, good, then you're set. If not, yeah, then you have a problem. Regarding one boogeyman of content creation, you can see it already on on the screen. That is the dreaded content treadmill. Sure, you've heard it you've heard it a couple of times that oh yeah don't don't go into content treadmill territory stuff like that but uh yeah i say don't be don't be too afraid of that and i know what you i know what you're asking 
You're asking, hey, Jan, aren't you from uh, Slovakia? Well, yes, I am. And that means you probably get paid in uh, moldy bread and vodka. Well, and let me correct you right there, because we in Slovakia get paid with uh, moldy bread and borovička. Now, but on a, on a more serious note, uh, we actually, uh, the e base economics are pretty simple regarding all this content treadmill stuff. If you can churn out co good quality content fast enough that it actually nets you a profit, then profit it is, okay? If that is what you can do, if that is something that you're comfortable with, and know, you know that you're in for a long haul with, uh, with all the content creation and, and the treadmill that you're gonna create for yourself, but if it pays you money, don't leave it on the table, okay? This is something that a lot of developers, I think, leave on the table just because it's not fancy enough or that they heard a lot of, lot of boogie stuff about it, but come on. The basic economics check out if it works if it pays you if, if it pays your bills and you're looking to pay your bills then hey don't leave it on the table of course if you got better stuff to do of course go go wild but do not be afraid of the content treadmill the base economics just really do hold up all right but how do we get all this magnificent content to our players updates of course we love updates, you love updates, but who loves updates the most are our players. Oh yes, they do. And uh, the one thing that they really do like about these updates is when they can rely on these updates. And that brings us to the point where that updates should be three things. So yes, here we go. The glorious revolution of content creation. Updates should be three things, as frequent as possible, push yourself a little bit, truly try to try to test your limits regarding uh, content creation, how often can you pull it out, and then continue to do so, and continue to do so regularly, which is the second point. These updates should truly be regular. We as a human species, we suck at a lot of things, okay? We... I would even say, go as far as to say we suck at most of the things we do. One thing that we do, don't suck at is pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is a great tool and a great tool for your players as well. Because when they know that the update is coming, whenever, Tuesday, Friday, maybe even nail down the hour, great, that'd be fantastic. You're good. Because you will get more players into your game on this interval and you can present them the content that you created to a higher audience. And of course, the third one is pretty self-explanatory, be as relevant as possible, of course. You want to put out content that actually speaks to the players. You uh, not just have content that nobody wants to play, but you will find out soon enough if it is or is not the content that the players will want to play. Anyhow, just have a plan and uh, just space it all out. Don't put everything nice into one update just to have your next three updates pro provide nothing of value to the player, okay? Keep that in mind. And as I said, anticipation is key. Uh, one, fun, uh, one fun actually da data that you can keep in mind uh, with us in Pixel Federation, a regular, having regular updates brought us 5% daily active users on the update day, no matter the content that we put out, okay? It may be an event, it may, might be just a regular update with what almost nothing there. Relevant, sure, who knows who, I won't be the judge of that, 5% plus, which is great. That means that anything that you put up, if you have a regular, uh, regular update schedule, it's a much larger audience. You definitely want to go for that. That is that is a that is a boost you don't want to miss out on. It really it creates a habit, retention, all that stuff. You, you know the basics. This is this one helps a lot. So regular updates. Yeah, this is kind of the second main of the of the whole thing. Uh, nothing set in stone. What what does that mean? Well, that means that you know nothing. And I know nothing, and everybody who starts up a life ops game knows nothing, okay? Socrates was very right. We do not 
no a thing and that holds especially true for light bulbs because the landscape changes almost daily uh new trends emerge old trends die off and there you are with a game that should should be should be played for years how do you how do you do that well the mo this is like the second most important po point of this whole presentation and that is freedom and that is not don't box yourself in don't have things that are set in stone because then the glorious revolution of your content life up game will end up like this yeah this is also an end to a glorious revolution just a pile of rubble and some dust we don't want to go there how do we don't go there well that's with of course being agile adapting but what does that actually means in plain talk is just testing out stuff okay testing out stuff and not only testing out but also thinking about contingency plans okay Contingency plans are absolutely crucial. Whatever you put out, you have to measure. Your data analyst will gonna be your best friend as a, a if you're a game designer, believe you me. You wanna if you're not on good terms right now, you might wanna work on that because in the future you'll be the best of buddies. Uh, you wanna test that out, and you as a game designer, you already have to have a contingency plan all times. Okay. We put out new content. Will it be good? Good. But what next? Will it be bad? Well, it could be better. But what next? What's important? What's truly important? It's not if it's good or bad. If it, It's what you do after the fact that you learn which one of these it actually was. Okay? The sooner you test it out, the better, of course. We'll help you adjust. And, uh, and of course, take, and take a name that your player base might like. And regarding your player base, there's one fun thing that I like to like to share in uh, with, when talking about live ops. You can see it already on the screen. Don't be afraid to to actually go for a shotgun approach from time to time. Okay. Do some variety. Insert some stuff that you might think that uh, might be controversial with your crowd. You know, they might not like it you have you have like a vision of who who your players are even if you if you don't have the hard data you have, you pretty much have a have something that you that you keep in, in mind but try it out believe me you will be surprised i think more often than not that your player base is a little bit broader than you think and then they might like stuff that you thought they actually might not and it will bring you a a lot of profit that you would just uh, kind of leave on the table but of course very viable question is how to do that well yeah because a shotgun approach can of course be can it actually can do some damage to your game how not to do the damage and for that of course i type in iddqd again and we summon the doom guy the cheat code this one is a big one okay this one i love 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 because it's filthy this is a filthy cheat. Test it through events, okay? You should have events. I'll, I'll get to events later, but still, everybody knows you will have events in a live ops game. And those are by nature time-gated content, which is absolutely gorgeous to, for testing out stuff that you're not sure, not so sure it will work, okay? Anything you want to do, do anything you want to test out, test it through an event. You would have to try really, really hard to blop up things that bad then then that a week or two of life ops couldn't just wash away okay so yeah you messed up but hey it'll just water under the bridge that's what events do for you okay this is where you can just tip your toe in the water see how it feels maybe you only discover fantastic stuff maybe you discover some horrendous failures but they won't stick around and that is more the most important so this one this cheat code my absolutely personal favorite all right, something similar, but this time a little bit more uh, monetization uh, oriented. Don't bet on a single horse, okay? Uh, the old jockeys knew that. This one, the old, all the har uh, horse racers know that. This one, uh, find us in the world. All, we, get, we get back to know that you know nothing, okay? Uh, design and implement, you can see that on the screen. Different streams of income for your game are absolutely crucial when you're doing a life ops game. Why? Because you don't, actually might not know what the players will want to buy 
will have some experience, sure. You will have a pretty good hypothesis of what will happen, but you won't be sure. And uh, of course, with life ops games, there's another element, and that is time. Some things might change over time that the player base grows more mature. They will actually seek something else that they bought in the beginning of the game and and so on and so forth. So keep this one in mind. And I have a very, very good example for that. Uh, that is for, from our uh, most uh, successful game, actually, from Diggy's Adventure. When we started out, it's a very old school, old school type of puzzle adventure game with a energy mechanic. What we did was, of course, introduce camp equipment. You have a camp, and there you can, there you have camp equipment that you can like uh, use to boost your energy income, right? Your energy regeneration rate, your energy capacity, stuff like that. And we were adamant that, yeah, this is this is it. This is stuff that players will want to invest their hard-earned money in, and that'll be great. We were not completely wrong, but then. Now this is relatively late in the development. We also thought like, oh, okay, and then just add some add some like instant energy boosters there. Because come on, there might be a time where I don't know, you have to pick up the kids from football practice in the evening or something, and you just kind of want to finish that level right now, no matter what. So yeah, why not? We we put them in. But we put them in, we were young and inexperienced. That's why I want you to be way more experienced than we were at the time we put them in just because it was not that much work okay and i was like yeah just put him in okay it's not much work see what and it probably won't do any damage you see where i'm going with this right it actually made up 70 percent of our revenues in the first three years okay <laughs> insane I wouldn't be here if we actually didn't put instant energy usables in the game. So, and of course, I'm not telling you do instant energy in your games. No, no, no. The takeaway is really diversify your income streams because you you just don't know what will actually be the big hitter at the end of the day. We'll find out and you'll see and you'll adapt, but don't start out boxing yourself in. Okay, the next one is a, is a quickie this one is uh, levels of course levels work you know that uh, this is just on the progress side of things you kind of want to keep this in mind it's very cheap to do and it provides great value look at these guys right strutting around like they own the place all them shiny metals everywhere and they even haven't and they actually even weren't in war and those are our players they don't actually want to be in a war, most probably, but they want them shiny medals. So levels, achievements, stars, badges, you name it, put it in. It's quite cheap to do achievements, stuff like that. It highlights all the progress that you painstakingly put into your game. And it just kind of is, is like the, the black outline on a comic feature. And... One funny thing it can actually create on its own is like this 4X uh, type of just one more turn, just under, just like in the, in the just like mesh creating under one more level, one more star, one more badge. I can, I can do this one. And you never know. They stick in your game. Who, who, else, who knows what they might find, might find, might pretend way better. So just put them in an easy no-brainer. Definitely, definitely cannot over... Uh, I cannot over overvalue these next one of course you know that you will want to do this but let me tell you that you will is segmenting your players all right segmenting your players works uh, along two main axes those are the content segmentation that means anywhere that your player is actually uh, existing on your on your progress curve okay that means is he is he, is he a newbie starting out is he a veteran already knowing the ropes is he a complete legend that chewed up through all of your content this is the content segmentation and of course you've got monetization segmentation monetization segmentation is like yeah you got you will have the stingy players that will never want to catch part with their hard-earned dollars no matter what and then you will have the players that will just kind of shower you in banknotes because i don't know their grandmother gave them for birthday or whatever and you have to know which one is which because 
The goal is, as you can see, to deliver relevant content. You cannot, of course, do a high price package for the stingy players. You actually don't even want to do like very cheap packages for the high high payers because you want to provide, of course, some relevant content that is there, and they are actually looking more usually for for high 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 level high powered content more than for the good price stuff like this so keep this in mind and start very very early on as i said hi to all the data analysts i'll be your best friends segment your player base so that you can offer them the most relevant offers the remote and serve the re most relevant content that you that you can okay game features this is a big one although very usually overestimated by by the crowd what i what i mean uh, is yeah that will take your little ladder to be this monster of epic doom sure but no two things one thing that features are and one thing that features are not what they are is uh what they are not let's start that they, they are not a driver for long-term engagement they are like or for spike engagement features plateau out you introduce a new feature it's the buzz everybody loves it everything's great the players go crazy good but then after a while it's just something that's in your game end of story nobody will care about it of course you need to have features because what they do 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 is increase your longevity the as you can see on the slide their role is to kind of invisibly make the game more interesting you cannot have a game that doesn't change at all of course but just don't bet on features to be the one that will carry like this engagement spikes that will monetize that will kind of uh, uh engage your your player base for for the longest and the most effectively what does are events well, of course everybody knows about events you should have one everybody should have one stuff like that so of course, events, easy, fine. Because as you can see, the path to glorious revolution is colorful. But um, with events, uh, some, some basics uh, that you, I think, should think before that you actually release it uh, is, of course, having it planned out, okay? Like an event system doesn't have to be the most flashy thing in the world, uh, but always remember that you have uh, like, a couple of couple of approaches that you can use either it is like content heavy epics as you see or maybe even just tweaks in your in your systems like have i don't know half half time off for a week is an event in itself a great easy event that you can probably just set up in your definitions and you're done not nothing more required and of course then you have, can have like the iliad and odyssey all having played out in your robo fighter game just because it is the best event you can think of sure works as well but it doesn't have to be one or the other you can, what i actually kind of advise is to mix it up a little bit have small events have large events have content heavy events and have then you know, very content light events just kind of twist you can you can twist around like really your definitions the speeds the the, the rates whatever and actually call it a full-fledged event no problem so think about it but uh one thing that we uh, that i want to want to tell you about is of course another cheat i love cheats if you suck at games as much as i do you tend to appreciate cheats and this one here is freedom okay you will need all the freedom that you can get for your event system because with events you will want to go broad okay you will want to test out a lot of things we already mentioned that in a different cheat code you will want to test out you will want to introduce new stuff you will want to test out uh, anything either content wise or mechanics wise that you want so please make them as detached from your main uh, game narrative as possible okay the more detached is the better because if you have like something that will allow you if you have like i don't know a medieval sim city builder game to introduce aliens and the gay uh, the player is not batting an eye it's like mm, yeah sure aliens why not okay so grant this anytime you think about think about events think about william wallace about freedom okay this this one is this one is very important okay uh so 
And actually, to to wrap it up a, a little bit, I've talked about two main two main lines of thinking here in this presentation. I hope you kind of kind of figure that out. Uh, and those two those two are progress, of course. That was the first most important point that you will want to have if it is if it is a game for life ops. You will want to have progress there. You want to, want it to be as tangible as possible. You want the players to to know to actually anticipate it, to anticipate how you create the pro content, how you deliver the content, how they will interact with it. And the second one that was true for half the points that I was talking about is freedom. Okay, grant you, and that is for yourself. First one is for the players. Second one is for yourself, and that is freedom. Grant yourself all the freedom that you can. Don't box yourself in no matter what, because you will regret it later. Of course, it will happen. It will happen. It happens all the time. But to minimize it is a great, great, great idea so that you can actually run this game pretty much forever. Okay? So, and that brings us to my mnemotechnical helper, my last slide of the presentation, and that is this, a bearded Mel Gibson with a Scottish war paint of freedom. So think about, think about Mel Gibson with a old Mel Gibson with a war paint when you think about life ops. You want there to be progress, that is the pushy white beard, and you want there to be the freedom for you and of course your place. So, all right, thank you very much. For, for your attention and we can see what the Q&A has brought us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, it, like, it was such a great talk, uh, so uh, much information. I believe we will have so many viewers on the video recording after the talk because this can be used like as a knowledge base for the newbie game designers. And like, really thank you for that. Uh, I believe we have time only for a couple of questions. First one is mine. Uh, could you say, what is Borovichka? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. Thank you for asking. Borovichka is a Slovak variant of gin. Great, great. I should try it. I you will. definitely should, but be careful. All right, all right. <laughs> so, uh, and like to the actual questions. Um, yeah. I like the one uh, when we are asked um, that uh, long projects uh, usually mean a lot of ideas, uh, how to improve gameplay and content. How do you measure impact of those perspective changes and find a common track with your, uh, with your team? Uh, well, how do we measure that? Well, we first thing for is and then when we introduce something we need to know what it should aim for all right so it's if we, if we design something i don't know as a, as, as a feature we need to know what that feature aims for is it a and those are pretty much like the two main categories are is it a retention feature or is it a monetization feature and of course we have to know where in the game in the player's life cycle it actually gets introduced and then we just kind of look at the hard numbers. If it's a if it's a retention feature, do we see the retention go, going up, going down, whatever? Then it was successful or uh, or it was not. If it's a monetization feature, of course we look at the wallet at the end of the day and see if it's full or not. Mm, simple as that. So, but the main 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 thing is just to know what you're aiming for because if you just kind of never ever design a feature or an event or anything just to be cool, just because it's cool. Hey, let's have aliens because it's cool. No, no, let's have aliens because aliens will boost our retention by probably 5%. And then you can measure, was it five? Maybe it was three, but it was still a plus. So, okay, aliens work, why not? Maybe actually there was a huge, a larger drop off and a churn than was expected. So, but you will, won't know that if you just introduce them because you found them to be cool. Okay, so definitely, know what you're aiming for even like put it in numbers put it in basic rudimentary numbers of what your expectations maybe are it will help out a lot and it brings also all the whole team on tracks uh, whether or not when you're talking with the with the programmers or design, the designers or the artists of what that feature or the event or whatever the content that you create should accomplish 
they know what angle to work a little bit because of course you as, you as a game designer cannot just oversee every minute detail there and it gives them something to, to kind of work um, work with Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, great answer. And just to let you know, we have huge amount of thumbs up uh, and likes and uh, gratefuls um, in the in the chat. Hey, great. And yeah, uh, the talk was amazing. You are a great actor, a great speaker. Thanks for coming. And we have more questions coming. So please uh, go by the link I've sent to you uh, yeah. to the chat section, to the special Q&H uh, section in the chats and just um, spend some time with uh, the audience and answer some questions. I think you will have some great discussion with the guys. All right. Yeah, we'll be happy to do that. Thanks a lot and hope to see you in person uh, soon someday. Hope, hope that as well.